Hello and welcome to a very special edition of the Movie Scramble podcast. Today I am joined by only one of my famous colleagues. Today it is just myself and Mary Thomas, for obvious reasons, will not be joining us today uh, and we'll go into that in a wee minute. But Mary, how are you? I'm really good. It's good to see you. Um, it's a shame all the gang's not back together, but yeah, no, it's good to get on and chat movies. I've been really looking forward to recording this all day. Nice one. As I said, Thomas won't be joining us and for a very good reason. He is he has no input to this conversation whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Today we are doing a bit of a debrief of the Glasgow Film Festival, which this year, for obvious reasons, didn't follow its normal format. In previous years, the film festival was over 10 days and was in a number of cinemas across Glasgow and the west of Scotland. This year, it was all online. Now, Glasgow Film has its own platform that it started screening films on, basically as a test in advance of the festival. It's called Glasgow at Home, and they utilised this for the festival and presented a number of films over the course of 12 days, all online. Now, the figures from the festival are actually very interesting. There was 37,733 views of the films, which, which was 10 world premieres, three European premieres and 49 UK premieres. So it was a little cut down from the normal festival, but the quality was certainly still there. I mean, normally we are talking about maybe double that number of films over the course of the, the 10 days, basically, because you get films in the GFT and Cineworld and all sorts of special events and things like that. It's, it's really rather packed. As I said, this year it was a wee bit different. We still had uh, an opening film, Minari, and a closing film, Spring Blossom. And in between that time, there was a whole host of content to keep everybody pretty happy. Personally, I thought it worked very, very well. I thought the festival, under very trying and difficult circumstances, really did pull it off this year. It was a joy to watch, especially because I didn't really have to get dressed in any way in order to watch <laughs> any films. <laughs> Mary, what were your initial impressions of the festival? Do you know, when obviously you realised that this wasn't going to go ahead in person, I was a wee bit nervous because I think part of it for me is that the Glasgow Film Theatre experience, I love that cinema. It's, it's so beautiful. It's, it's kept all of its art deco features. It's really just quite a striking building to be in and I think that when you sit in the seats in GFT especially in GFT1 I feel like it makes you sit up straighter you pay attention because you're kind of surrounded by all this grandeur and it really makes you think about you know what it is you're watching and how special it is to be part of something like that so I was a bit worried however the it, the platform itself the Glasgow Film at Home couldn't have been any better the actual like quality of the screeners was incredible i I don't know why I was expecting something that was, I don't know, like, not that it was going to be, like, bad quality, but I just, it felt, like, really crisp and clear and like you were actually in the cinema. So all I did was watch as much as I could on my actual TV to try and recreate that cinema experience of, you know, lights off, watch the film or whatever on the big screen or as big a screen as you can uh, manage. And, yeah, the quality and the diversity of the content, as always, was incredible I did watch a couple of the bigger releases this year, which I actually don't usually do, but I just, there was so much to choose from. Like, it was not like, okay, well, it's online this year, so there's only like 20 films, take your pick. There was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, you know, female directors, um, people of colour in the cast, films about LGBT experience, films about, you know, female experience, retro sort of throwback horrors, comedies, dramas, you name it. And it just, I didn't lose any sense of, like I didn't feel like I'd sort of been shortchanged. It definitely still felt like this is a good festival. So, yeah, no, I really, really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. The festival platform was provided by a company called Shift72, who also did it mm -hmm. for the London Film Festival. Now, mm -hmm. having a look at that, obviously the organisers of the Glasgow Film Festival spoke to 
the likes of the London Film Festival and there was various other festivals. They were in a very good position in that there had been a number of high profile festivals prior to Glasgow. Obviously, there was still the likes of Toronto and London and I think it was like Telluride and various other places all had their festivals ahead of this. So they were able to speak to various organisers in these other areas and work out sort of the best format for Glasgow. And what they decided was they would have the films premiering at a certain time on a certain date to, to give a full sort of schedule. But there was elements there that allowed people to watch the film at their own pace and within a time period. For instance, if you bought a film, then it was made available to you. Say, say you bought it and it was coming on on the Monday at half past seven, then from you would have three days to watch it. And mm-hmm. within those three days, you would have 12 hours once you actually started, you clicked play. So that gave people an awful lot of freedom. They weren't actually constrained by having to turn up at a screen and view it at a certain time. And then, mm-hmm. as always happens with these festivals, you get double booked or there's there's things that you want to see and you just, they just physically can't get from one venue to another in time in order to see it. So it kind of eliminated all that as well. So it was a very pleasant experience because of that. And as you say, the quality of the presentation was absolutely fantastic. It was HD quality and you just, well, I was just like yourself, I plugged my laptop straight into the television and just watched it straight from there and absolutely perfect, really good. So let's talk about the films themselves. Now, as I say, there was a number of high quality movies that were out there. What I found was that, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but film festivals are miserable. They really are. See the films? <laughs> yeah. that you get well, we said there. this, yeah. <laughs> they are miserable. It's, it's all death and destruction. And oh, man, it's just, it, it can be really, really bleak. You don't get a lot of light-hearted romantic yeah. comedies let's say uh, for a very good reason because it's not that type of environment now under normal circumstances that's fine it's all escapism anyway but it was kind of different this year especially if you're sitting in your house and you're, you're watching two guys in south korea battle out in the street you know <laughs> and, it's, and you're going oh my god you know okay it, yeah we get a bit much but it was very good. So what we will do is we will talk about some of our favourites, talk about a couple of favourite films and kind of take it from there. Now, you did an awful lot of reviews for the site. Everybody, please check them out. They are all excellent. That would be lovely. So Thank you. What was your sort of first pick, your sort of first highlight of the festival? Oh, do you know, I've really struggled with this all day because there's Kind of three or four films that sort of stood out, like really, really stood out. As you say, there was plenty of, of grim to go around. There was a couple where I was like, not struggling to get to the end, but I missed having the relief of like, I don't know, heading to the Raven afterwards for a pint to debrief <laughs> as opposed to just sitting in my jammies on the couch. I think the first pick that I'm going to go with is, oh, this is so hard. I think I'm going to go with Vicious Fun, which was part of the kind of Fright Fest sort of sub festival i don't know if you'd call it that this is what you said to me a group of serial killers attending a 12-step meeting tried to kill me and my accomplice before disappearing leaving us with three dead bodies no two dead bodies it's one word right bullshit um sorry to interrupt your meeting thanks so much for coming out how do you maintain your lifestyle and keep your urges under control I murdered the same victim repeatedly. Just give me a pass. Have you ever bitten into a kidney? What is this, some kind of support group for serial killers? Why are you here? It's complicated. It's a sort of retro 80s horror comedy where a young guy who is 100% dressed like Marty McFly and very much on purpose finds himself in basically what you would call Serial Killers Anonymous. It's a sort of support group for uh, people who are controlling their urges, shall we say. And I absolutely loved this from start to finish. It was so over the top, so mental. There was like proper 80s synth just blasting all the way through it while some of these ridiculous, like even people are getting their insides pulled out or, you know, hands hacked off. It was so much fun. It was so like oh, what's the word, like kind of kitsch almost, but in a good way. But there was plenty of violence, there was plenty of nonsense. The only thing I missed was seeing it with a Fright Fest audience because Fright Fest audiences usually 
super loud, super rowdy, and they're like, you know, whooping and hollering the whole way through the film and laughing out loud. But oh, I just love this film, and I I can't recommend it enough. If it comes to Shudder, something which a few of the, the Fright Fest uh, movies usually do, I cannot recommend it enough. It was hysterical, but has plenty of violence and sort of jump scares to keep you going as well. I know you saw it as well and, and loved it. It's such a good movie. Oh yeah, it was excellent. I, I really liked the the eighties sort of throwback element of it. Yeah, and the fact that it was complete. It, it didn't care that it was completely over the top. The the serial killers were proper hack and slash killers. Yeah. With uh, the, the, their only motivation was that they were they were killing people, and they all really enjoyed doing it. And yeah, the the support group element of it was excellent. The fact yeah. that they, they they would meet to talk about their their problems and everything. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Really, really good. Really, very, very well thought through film. Yeah, uh, and it's, yeah. I mean, the, the, do with it is the the whole sort of production design, the fact that it looked like an eighties video and everything like that as well. Yeah, it just it was smashing. And like you say, the the Marty McFly link wasn't lost on me either. That was yeah, <laughs> yeah excellent choice. Really good. My first choice is. Uh, it's actually one of the few comedies that I managed to see at the film festival. It's called Redemption of a Rogue. A tale of great deluge falls into my mind. A tale from the gutter. But even in the sewers of the world, all humans have a craving for life. Are you happy with something? It's a, a very dark comedy, obviously, as you would imagine for for these sort of times. Basically, the the story of this one is it's a, a rogue, as in the of in the title, who is living. He's been living away from home for years, and he gets the phone call. His father's dying. He has to come back, so he goes back home, visits with his father, and he's with his father. It's a very solemn moment at the bedside and he's trying to speak to his father you know sort of say last goodbyes to him and his father starts speaking but he can't understand him he's mumbling so he goes in closer and closer and then his father puts his hand around his neck and tries to strangle him and this is <laughs> with his father's last breath he tries to strangle him and then he dies <laughs> Is this an Irish movie? This is like a very like Irish family yeah. set up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very much so, yeah. So what happens after that is obviously they, they have to bury the old guy. So get the, the funeral arranged, get the coffin and all that. And as they're walking out the door, him and his brother, I should say, are walking out the door with the coffin up mm -hmm. above their arms. A lawyer turns up and says, you can only bury your father on a day when it isn't raining. Otherwise, you lose the house and everything. You just He's going to give it away. And of course, as soon as the old guy died, it started raining and it rained heavily and it just didn't stop. So it's almost like a sort of a groundhog day thing. He's going through yeah. this over and over. There's loads of religious imagery in it. Obviously, it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's all sorts of like, obviously, like, there's all sorts of stuff going on with his brother. He meets a fallen woman who's actually a singer in a, a local bar, and she's always wearing red. She's a very sort of Mary Magdalene type of figure. There's uh, references to like the Last Supper and all sorts of things like that. And then at, at one point, he, he is uh, having a conversation with these sort of local gangsters who are trying to intimidate him and his brother. And he basically disproves the whole, the plagues thing that hit Egypt, all the, the, mm -hmm. the frogs and the locusts and all that. And it's just totally spot on. It's just absolutely brilliant. It was so funny, but so dark at the same time. And it was just cracking. You, you knew you were that it was going to be really good right from the very first sort of scene where it's he's in a room and he's like completely mm -hmm. he's he's completely out of it and everything and he's just he's just a bit of a mess and you just think yeah i'm going to enjoy this film this is really good it really signposts everything really quickly and you're just you get totally into it you just love it and there's lots of wee bits in it that just make you laugh out loud all the time there was like for instance he's he's walking down the street in his his hometown he's just come back and everybody's going oh, is he back in town and all this? You know, and there's this music <laughs> thing. And the, the, the music is it's a sort of like a strange sort of jazzy music's playing in the background. And he walks past a shop and there's a band 
with uh, a bit like a brass band and all that. And they're in the shop practicing, and then they see them and they stop, and obviously the music stops because that's the. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love really, it. That really sounds good. so good. I can't believe I didn't see that. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Well, that was that was by far the the highlight for me, and I'd never seen anybody that was in it before, so it was like a yeah. cracking, absolutely cracking movie. I, I really hope that it gets a a decent review or a decent sort of a release over the next couple of months because it's just it's exactly the kind of film that people need to see at the moment. Yeah, I know. Do you know it's funny because when I think about that vicious fun for for all that it obviously is a movie about serial killers and sort of surviving the night with serial killers, there was so much of it that was so funny, mm-hmm. and the character the character of Bob is literally my new favourite serial killer. <laughs> like, but there's so much of it that you'll find yourself sort of bouncing along to the soundtrack, or because you're laughing out loud, it wasn't a kind of conventional horror. In the fact, I didn't feel like tense. I came out of it going, "That was so much fun." It was almost like a kind of like. Like the kind of like buzz you get when you come off a roller coaster and you're like, I want to do it again. That's how I felt watching that movie. It, it did. It was kind of uplifting for all that, that sounds like definitely not an uplifting movie, but if you get what mm-hmm. I mean, it's fun. So that Redemption of a Rogue sounds brilliant. Though it might get picked up, maybe I don't know. It sounds like like Film Four do a lot of kind of good sort of British or sort of sorry, not British because it's a uh, Irish sort of like, but they do showcase a lot of homegrown movies like that. So maybe it'll get picked up in time. Mm-hmm. I certainly hope so. Yeah, it's. Definitely worth seeking out. Uh, if nothing else, I think it'll probably be on at the GFT at some point because they yeah. seem to show a lot of the films that they show in the festival and sort of re-show them as part of their normal schedule. So chances are it will come out at some point, hopefully. So next choice. So I think I'm going to go with Riders of Justice for all the Mads Mikkelsen fans out there. I didn't really know what to expect. I kind of thought because of the sort of still that they'd used and the, the name of it, I thought it was going to be a kind of grimy sort of biker movie. And he certainly sort of looks like that in the picture. This kind of just confounded my expectations and I still don't quite know how to describe it. But it kind of starts off with a you know a massive big explosion on a train and it kind of suggests that there are certain quirks of fate that you know if people had been sitting in certain seats or people had got off the train at a different time you know kind of how would life turned out sort of thing but then it sort of goes on to these two maths geeks and that's the only way I can describe them who turn up at Mads Mikkelsen's house because he's obviously he's lost his wife at this explosion and they're like we think we can prove that this was not an accident it wasn't a train crash and we think we can prove this was done on purpose and we're going to help you avenge your wife and from there I'm kind of loath to use this term, but it kind of becomes like a screwball comedy. Like, I know that sounds ridiculous because there is, again, like Vicious Fun, there's so much violence and it is some pretty nasty stuff. But it's coupled with this really, like, just savage comedy that runs all the way through it. Like, it's the whole kind of idea of, you know, the sort of odd couple because these these two math geeks with their, you know, severely overweight friend who likes to hack into CCTV cameras and has been bribed by pizza to come and, you know, help them find out who this who this bomber might be. And obviously Mads is this kind of stoic ex-army, you know, just trying to look after his daughter but really wants to basically kick fuck out if he ever's done this to his wife. And as I say, it doesn't sound great because it is it's a kind of comedy, drama, revenge, thriller, sort of violence type film it just works like it, I watched it and I, again I was like oh I could watch that again it was just it was so clever the humor was so dry and so well executed and I just thought everyone who was in it was excellent like there wasn't a wasted character it was just really really well done and I hope I'm thinking because it's got Mads Mikkelsen in it it will get a slightly bigger audience but I hope more people get to see it because I've just I've never seen something merge like you know a sort of revenge thriller with a screwball comedy before but it just, it really, really worked and I, I absolutely loved it. Well, it's very similar to, I mean, you were the one that pointed this out to me. It's very similar to Men and Chicken, which again is a yeah. combination of screwball comedy and just completely out there nuts, uh, loads of violence and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really like this film as well. It, there's a, a balance to be had between uh, a violent, thriller and a comedy and they they kind of did that like there was a a scene where they were all in the car and Mm -hmm. Nicholson turns around and punches the guy and it's actually funny when you do it when he does it but then it's whoa it gets really dark there you know (laughs) it got really really strange it got over that and there was obviously the whole story about it was obviously 
concentrating on the Mads Mikkelsen character and his daughter mm -hmm. and their relationship and how they were trying to basically come to terms with the fact that it was just the two of them and everything. Yeah, that worked really well. It was, but yes, it, it's a strange title of a film. I don't know if that's just the translation is a bit strange because yeah. Raiders of Justice sounds like well, it sounds like a Bon Jovi song, you know. <laughs> makes me think of like leather waistcoats with like you know weird images or whatever printed on them it just it did I I kind of wondered where it come from because the Danish title certainly looked really really long when you saw it on screen and I was like wonder if that is an exact translation or not because yeah when if you do watch it yeah the the maths geeks and the sort of CCTV guy they're definitely not I mean they're riding nowhere fast that's for sure <laughs> they're just kind of we guys and anoraks who like to work out you know problems or whatever but uh, yeah, it just it was such a great film, and I think hopefully because it is a kind of Mads Mikkelsen vehicle that it will get picked up. Yeah, I uh, certainly hope so. It was it was particularly good. My second pick is a Spanish film called Rosa's Wedding. This is a film that was about a forty-something woman who basically has had enough of her life. She's in a situation where she has a teenage daughter who is living away from home. I think she's actually living in another country uh, with a couple of kids. She is working uh, in a, I think it's a, one of these facilities that provide clothing and outfits for television and movies. So she's yeah. working there. She's not in charge of it, but she seems to be doing the majority of the work. So she's been, she works really hard for all this. And because she doesn't have any dependents in terms of her own family, Everybody just kind of piles their problems onto her. Her brother asks her to look after his kids because he's going through a divorce. So he has, she has to go and feed them and look after them. She has to take her father to his medical appointments. And what really breaks the back of the camel, so to speak, is the fact that she gets home and there's a pile of plants lined up outside her house from her next door neighbour who has gone away on holiday for three weeks and it's just said, water me. <laughs> so her moment of enlightenment is when she's actually doing a fitting for an actress who is going to be involved in a wedding scene and the the woman is reciting her lines while she's getting dressed up in her, her wedding dress and she's like going through her vows saying you know I, I I promise to be faithful and all this and it just kind of sets off something in her own brain so she decides that she's going to chuck everything she's going to go back to her own hometown where her mother and father came from, and she's going to reopen her mother's dress shop, which has been lying dormant for years and years, and that's what she's going to do. And in addition to that, she's going to get married to herself. Now, this is where the... the yeah. This Sorry, that's just not what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> I was like, oh, right, okay. <laughs> she, it's the, the phrasing of that that actually sets up the sort of the meat of the story because in saying that that she was going to get married then her family automatically thinks she's getting married to the the guy that she's seeing on and off yeah. but in reality she's basically making a commitment to say I'm going to look after myself I am number one here you know I, I'm, I've been doing things for everybody else and I've been neglecting myself so therefore from now on it's all going to be about me everything has got to do it and you know so looking inward rather than th worrying about what everybody else is doing. But she doesn't really communicate that to her family. So she 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 says to her brother and she says to her sister and her father, look, I'm going to get going to have this ceremony on the beach. I'd like you all to come and but it's going to be very small. But of course when the brother gets into town, he meets up with other people who they've known for years and years because it's their old hometown. They invite them all the, he he hires like the local town hall and there's a band and all sorts of things and uh, the, the woman is obviously just Rosa, she's just feeling completely out of control because everything is just going wrong about it and that's where the sort of the comedy elements, it's very gentle comedy it's not total laugh out loud stuff but it's a really really nice film, it really it works very well and obviously Spanish settings and then you've got your the sort of uh, the Spanish sensibilities in, in terms of the film. So it's very fast and everything. The the dialogue is very fast and everything. So you have mm -hmm. to really sort of concentrate to keep up, even more so than just being able to 
read the subtitles so you have to mm -hmm. really invest yourself in it and it, it really pays off it was a it was a, an excellent wee film it was a real surprise because it was just it was one that was on and i thought oh, i'll give that a watch it doesn't you know it might not be very much at all but it was a real surprise really thought it was really kind of cracking i really hope they put that on the glasgow film at home platform soon because you have just sold that to me like that just sounds perfect like this whole idea of this like wedding becoming even more chaotic when it's not actually like an actual wedding it's just this woman declaring her love for herself like oh I'm, I'm there for that I'm gutted I have missed that and I really hope we put that on the platform soon because that sounds tremendous. Obviously the films were presented online and under normal circumstances when you attend screenings at the Glam Glasgow Film Festival you get uh, an introduction from one of the co-directors. Now, this year, it was all recorded introductions, which was a wee bit strange at first, but I thought it was actually very nice. It was a nice touch to kind of keep the continuity going. What did you think about that, Mary? It's either Alison or, or Alan I saw the majority of, and I just thought, that is so sweet that they have tried to sort of recapture this you know, moment where they get to talk about the film that they love or what you're about to see. And, and I'm just grateful that I didn't have to do the Sunny World to GFT sprint, because usually if you do that and then you walk in while somebody's given an introduction and cause it's uphill and I'm unfit, like you're usually trying to silently sort of breathe out your ass while they give this loving like chat about the film you're about to see. But I thought it was so nice. And each time when I uh, logged on to watch something, I was like, oh, this is so exciting. I wonder who's going to pop up, you know, and introduce it next. And they did the wee separate bit for the audience award. I was like, this has just made, made me really feel like, like it is a festival and not just I'm sitting watching movies in the house. I loved whoever their, you know, marketing and graphic design team are. I loved the little uh, animations before the movies as well. They also had like that as an Instagram filter and you could sort of join in with that as well. And I just thought it was really, really well executed. I loved it. Yeah, they usually theme their, their wee intros and everything like that in terms of the wee animations mm -hmm. on some of the themes of the actual festival. Like, for instance, the every morning at the, the festival, they would show uh, a film that's based on a theme, whether it be sci-fi or I, th I think it was Femme Fatale's one year as well. There was a lot of stuff like that. So but obviously they didn't do that this year because they just didn't have the capacity to do that. And at that, you would get Alan coming on and he would give a, like a 10 or 15 minute lecture on Planet of the mm -hmm. Apes, for instance, which is it was just fantastic. It. But yes, it, it, it's good to see that they were doing that as well. It was very welcome and it, it helped engage with the audiences, yeah. I, I felt, because it, it, it reminds you that you're not just sitting in your couch watching something. You are part yeah. of a sort of an online community, a very loose community, obviously. But yes, it was very good as well. Now, obviously, in addition to the films and the introductions, there were a number of Q&As done for actually quite a lot of the films. These sort of events can be a bit sort of stagey and a bit, a bit weird, especially when they're done online. So you obviously were involved in a couple of Q&As, you watched a couple of them. What did you think about this, this sort of yeah. format? So I, wa I watched the Q&A for the, the Mauritanian, because let's be honest, I'm a slag for Tahar Rahim, and I'm gutted that he's been missed out of the Oscars. And I watched the Q&A for Shorta. Now, you couldn't have got two different Q&As. So obviously the Mauritanian, it was, I think it was Alan Hunter um, that did that one. And you've got Jodie Foster, and you've got Kevin MacDonald, and you've got Tahar Rahim. And this is obviously part of a massive junket that they're doing and it was very, they gave great answers, really insightful, really like just good polished answers. Kevin McDonald was talking about obviously discovering cinema in Glasgow and his sort of love of that. And it was really, really nice. And there was lots of insights into the characters and stuff like that as well. So that was really good. And I really loved it. And then I watched the QA for Shorta and um, they were all like in different farms in various locations around Denmark. And in typical sort of Scandi fashion, they were quite stoic and quite like, this is what we did or oh sorry I can't hear you because I'm on a farm and it seemed a bit kind of like all over the place but part of me did kind of like that because it was it was less polished and I kind of enjoyed that as well and I just I thought that obviously because they were online and pre-recorded this is maybe access to material that you wouldn't have 
got at the film festival I think it, I mean it's they do do live Q&A's obviously but it tends to be with whatever whatever talent can can turn up now is it likely that Jodie Foster was going to come to the Glasgow Film Festival probably not or maybe I'm doing her a disservice maybe she would have but you get access to stuff and um, because it's online and because it's pre-recorded that maybe you wouldn't have got if, if it was just you know the festival in real life so I actually appreciated the fact that because it was online you got sort of you know bonus content that you might not have got otherwise and um, that's not to say it doesn't take away from the live Q&As that they usually have they're usually quite entertaining because you literally have no control over what questions are going to get thrown out from whoever's sitting in the audience but no I mean I thought it was good extra content especially because you know the films are only a tenor you can watch them you know as much as you want within that that window plus you get you know a wee bonus q and I think that's pretty good for the good value for money. Yeah it's all about the extra stuff really isn't it, it just it adds to the, the whole experience no, I didn't actually attend any of the Q&As. I was, attended the, the Q&A for the launch of it, which was mm-hmm. very good. And that was just the various people from the film festival themselves and a few journalists pitching in questions as well. But that was all. You had to submit your questions for that on, yeah. the, on the chat rather than just blurting out what you were uh, actually thinking. So it was controlled in a way. I mean, any Q&As I've actually attended at, the the festival have been pretty good because the people are there because they want to see the film. So they're not going to ask stupid questions or anything, you know, about what what Tahir Rahim's underwear situation was while he was on Guantanamo or anything like that. I love how you're insinuating like that I might have asked that question. Not at all. I I didn't cross (laughs) No, I would have probably asked that, you know. (laughs) <laughs> so what was the laundry service like you know did you, did you did you have a look at that you know that kind of thing yeah talk to me about your fake tan in the serpent what was that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so i think the festival was a success i i believe oh, absolutely. it was marketed that way and it seemed to work so it will return the festival has been announced that the the festival will run from the 2nd to the 13th of march next year so it's solely in march just because of the way the, the dates work i think it is. it's usually the end mm-hmm. of february start of march do you think that they will continue with this format in some way the reason i'm saying that is because they obviously get a number of people watching the films from outside of the west of Scotland area. People didn't need to travel to mm-hmm. Glasgow in order to watch the films, which uh, uh, part of the, the allure of a film, film festival is that you're bringing people into an area, it's good for the local economy, all that yeah. sort of stuff. But do you think that it's highlighted the fact that there is an audience out there for film festivals outside of the area and it would be worthwhile them keeping this going absolutely yeah yeah i did i mean i would love the the hybrid format purely because obviously it's it's my local festival if you want to call it that way and i I always want to physically be there and, and support like in person as much as i can but i think the hybrid model you know could potentially work just even from a, a coverage perspective because you know, you could have a, a critic living in, I don't know, Devon or something who just simply can't make it up for whatever reason, but can watch online. And there we are, some fantastic coverage, you know, UK wide for for this film festival. And it's a film festival that, you know, it's been the sort of smaller cousin of Edinburgh, but I think it's getting there in terms of the size, the quality of film that it attracts, the quality of talent that want to come and be part of it. So I think that having this hybrid model will ensure more wide-ranging coverage. I know that going to, I, I can't quite remember the reason, but it was the, you could only watch a movie if you were in the UK, as I know that sort of, you know, I think you'd mentioned John Lick's Citrus Festival, you can only watch it if you're in Spain, all that sort of thing. So yes, it does restrict the coverage to the UK, but, you know, we live in a global world where, you know, a UK critic could have loads of followers in America or Canada or mainland Europe. So once that review's out there, it can only benefit the festival and may well attract more people in person, you know, the following years if they hear the, the type of the caliber of the, the content that they have. So yeah, I, I hope they do. I, I mean, hybrid, as I say, would definitely be preferable for me because I would like to go in person, but actually having the option of, you know, catching a film on a, on a Tuesday night when I maybe wouldn't go into town or whatever, that would be amazing. Um, what about you? Are you hoping to, to go back in person next year or... Are you looking forward to more movies at home? I'm a bit like yourself. I thought the the home format 
worked very well. It worked an awful lot better than it did for the London Film Festival, basically yeah. because there was a very strict time limit on the film and what you could see. I think they, they only gave you a window of a couple hours to watch a film. Yeah. Well, for, a, from a critic's point of view, but from the point of view for for the Glasgow critics, it was it was a lot wider. You you weren't quite as constrained in when you could watch stuff. I think you still had up to three days to watch things, which was actually pretty yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, obviously, I'd like to get there. But I I like the fact that it's it's easier to schedule your viewing just to, just as a punter. I'm talking about here mm -hmm. because often, I mean, I've covered it now for what four or five years, and Every single year, there is at least three or four occasions where there are two films on at the same time that I want to see, and I can't just and because. It's Sophie's well, choice. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So uh, that would help with the, the likes of that, and obviously they've invested in the the online content as well. They've put together a, a platform that they can use, the Glasgow at Home platform. Yeah. So. The money's been spent on that, so I think they'll be looking to get some sort of long-term return on that. Because, as, as you said, it's a, a UK-wide thing. You know, it's not just for the film festival. You can watch Glasgow at Home from anywhere in the UK. They've mm -hmm. got the rights to show these films for however long your window is for that, you know, a couple of days or whatever it is. I, I would like to think that they would keep it going in some sort of capacity. It'll probably be a smaller capacity or it'll be... A supplement to the the festival mm -hmm. online yeah I, I really enjoy the buzz of it enjoy sitting with an audience especially an audience that's there because it's a film that they want to see like a, a difficult film from serbia or something like that yeah. but people are there because they want to see it they're not there because they're they're getting out of the house and they, they fancy uh, devouring the largest bucket of popcorn that they can actually find and going on their phone every 10 minutes which is kind of normal cinema yeah. going you know let's face it yeah. but yeah I, I i certainly hope that they do that i really do it would be yeah. it'd be most welcome put it that way yeah no as i say I, there was a couple of movies where i was like man i wish i'd watched that with other people because i bet it would have been just really like not raucous but you know what i mean it just that people would have been laughing people would have, you know people do like it's an excited audience as you say they're there because they want to see it and people would clap at different points or whatever a couple of movies i glad i was glad to watch in the house because i was greeting so try to limit how many times we're going to cry in public. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to what they have to offer next year and how they'll kind of go ahead and what they'll, as you say, you know, it might be a supplement or it might be an alternative to, you know, maybe it depends on what the appetite's like for that sort of thing. But I definitely think that this kind of hybrid platform would, would be really beneficial just in terms of getting the name out there of the festival and, as you say, enabling you to, you know, see a couple of movies that you fancy that on at the same time so it kind of works from a, a critic's perspective and a sort of consumer's perspective so yeah I'll be keen to see how they do it next year. Obviously there was less critics involved this year basically because they were trying to maximise the number of views. It's basically every film mm -hmm. that you, you get for a festival they I think they basically had to renegotiate everything because obviously under normal circumstances, it's just getting a license and showing a film maybe once or twice. But they, I, I'm assuming that they had to renegotiate license deals with just about every film, or at least with studios, to make sure that they could get these films for like three days and show them online and everything. So that was like a massive undertaking on top of the fact of trying to uh, organise a festival in the middle of a pandemic. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think they did very, very well and uh, can only congratulate them on it. I think it was fantastic. And the, f the fact was we got a press pass to the festival in order to see some of the films, which was obviously very welcome as well. And it would have been very easy for the festival to really cut that down. So it was only major yeah. outlets, uh, sort of national and international press that got it. But they were very mindful of the fact that they wanted to make sure that Everybody could get access that would normally get access, including some of the, the smaller places like ourselves. I mean, in the grand scheme of thing, we are minuscule, but they try and cater for everybody because they know that word of mouth is uh, very important for them as well, especially on social media. So I'd like to just say like, thanks very much to the Glasgow Film Festival again, because they have done such a good job. Yeah, no, I completely second that. First of all, thank you for considering smaller outlets like yourself, because... Do you know what? 
it's no matter where you write for if you write about movies you do so with love and with passion and with knowledge and I think it's amazing to to get the opportunity to, to cover these films as a kind of smaller outlet so yep, thank you to the press team who also responded to my ridiculous emails as well about not understanding how things work they must have been like oh christ it's hard again <laughs> so really really appreciate whoever was responding to those emails and yeah just thanks for putting on a, a really good show eh, as it were it was just it was so fantastic it kind of took me aback as to how excellent it was I was kind of unsure as I said at the beginning as to how that experience would be but I loved every second of it so roll on 2022. Nice so that is our wrap up of the Glasgow Film Festival 2021 uh most unusual festival in a most unusual year I can say with some confidence <laughs> and it's only February uh, it's only March actually that's that's even worse <laughs> only March yeah so thank you very much to our listeners as usual uh, we really appreciate everything that we do in terms of downloading and listening and occasionally commenting on stuff we do get comments back which is always good to hear and normally it's not anything uh, terribly negative for them so that's <laughs> that's obviously a bonus if you'd like to get in touch with us about anything to do with movies you can get us on all of the social media channels at movie scramble and you can email the podcast as well with any suggestions or comments at podcast at moviescramble.co.uk so i'd just like to say thanks very much for listening and we shall return very soon with a more scheduled program if you like so we shall see you soon bye bye bye